Excellent. Uh, right. Uh, Warwick, have you? We still can't see you. Still not, I'm afraid. I said at the moment I'm in the midway through through a house move, so I wonder whether that's got something to do with it. Um, the internet provider. Do you want me to I... put up the uh, the slides? Uh, I can do that. Let's see. Hang on, five seconds. Uh... Can you all see that now? That's looking good. On its way. Fantastic. Yep. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's, that's Brilliant. Fantastic. That. Size the tapes up. There we go. Fantastic. Okay. Well, good evening, ladies and gents. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Warwick Nauf. Uh, I am lead battlefield guide and battlefield coordinator uh, for the National Trust of Scotland. Uh, Battle of Bannockburn Centre. Um, quite literally where I am at the moment, my flat is quite literally about uh, 50 yards away from the Bruce statue. Um, we're right in the middle um, of the battlefield space. Um, my job really involves uh, taking groups of tourists around the, uh, the, the, the Bannockburn uh, interactive experience, uh, taking them for the events uh, and the background to the battle uh, and this can range from uh, military groups, school groups, uh, to just uh, general members of the public. Um, originally it involved uh, playing an interactive war game, you know, every, you know, six times a day. Uh, now it's, it's taking people not only around our experience, but also across the battlefield area as well. And also undertaking uh, costumed interpretation as well. Indeed, it's even come down to modeling uh, for the National Trust of Scotland. Uh, the, the, the marketing team about two years ago decided it was a brilliant idea that I should be uh, the, the, the face of the Battlefield Centre. What they hadn't explained to me was the places these po posters were being put uh, would be on the backs of buses and uh, the floor of Stirling Station as well. So I had a couple of hundred people uh, walking across my face uh, every morning. Uh, but that is by the by. So for the next hour, what we'll do is we'll go uh, over the, the background to the battle, the battlefield landscape, what actually ha happened in the battle itself, and also cover some of the battlefield archaeology uh, associated uh, with Bannockburn as well. Now, as I said, the lecture is the complete history. Um, there's lots and lots of it, uh, lots of lots of stuff to cover. Uh, if I do skip over anything um, that you're interested in, uh, just ask them the questions at the end, uh, and we'll cover that. Uh, in due course. Just to point out where the Bannockburn Battlefield actually is, um, it's on Scotland's east coast, it's just outside of Stirling, it's about three miles away from Stirling Castle, um, is quite central to where we are. And in terms of, of the Battle of Bannockburn, um, it's, it's a battle that almost everyone, um, everyone knows, like the battlefields of Hastings and Bosworth and Clodden, um, Bannockburn is a household name. It's represented on our money. It's been represented in comedy, in films. I'm afraid to say that Mel Gibson did not appear at Bannockburn. He, you know, William Wallace had been dead for about, uh, about nine years beforehand. Um, it's been represented recently, you know, by Netflix uh, in their films as well. It's been represented in comedy TV programs. If you saw on the History Channel, Why Do the Brits Win Every War with, uh, the, uh, with Al Murray, the pub landlord, uh, in November, you would have seen we did filming on the battlefield area. That ugly mug is me taking him around the battlefield. Um, so indeed, you know, it's been represented in comedy as well. It's been, uh, can, it's in music, you know, albums have been made about the battle and indeed, continues to be a site of, of political uh, sensibility and protest right up until the present day, whether it be uh, the independence movement or indeed the recent Black Lives Matter movement at uh, which uh, the, the monuments up at the, uh, up at the, uh, the, the, the Bannockburn estate uh, were vandalized as well. So Bannockburn continues to be a site uh, of extreme importance uh, to Scottish identity. But for a battle to happen at Bannockburn, there has to be a background to it. And to understand the events that surround the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, we need to know the history of the Wars of Independence 
proceeding it as well. They start in 1286 when Alexander III, the incumbent King of Scots, dies one night, uh, riding towards Kinghorn uh, to be with his new bride, Yolande. That puts the Scottish community uh, into flux. Who's going to be the next king of Scotland? A council of 30 nobles is, is uh, created uh, and they are adjudicated over by Edward I, the current uh, king of Scotland. Now, Edward I, um, although he seems like a, a good choice, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a political man, at the same time, uh, he is an arch politician. He has annexed Wales uh, back in the 1270s. There is no, uh, it's quite clear he could well do this with Scotland again as well. But Edward I is brought in to look at the Scottish nobility and say, well, who's going to be uh, the best person for the job? In Edward I's eyes, who's going to be the most amenable uh, to Scottish wishes? And he comes up with a number of candidates, the chief amongst them being Robert Bruce and uh, John Balliol. Now, John Balliol naturally is the most amenable. He's Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, he's uh, served in Edward's armies. He's fought in the Barons Wars down at the Battle of Lewis as well. Um, he has got just as many lands in England as he does in Scotland. And so naturally he is going to be able to bend uh, to Edward I's uh, wishes. And so he's made king. The problem is, is that as soon as this, uh, this deal is made between Scotland and England, um, Edward I immediately exploits it. He asks for taxation. He asks for lands in Scotland. He asks for Scottish soldiers uh, to serve in his wars on the continent in Gascony as well. And naturally, John Balliol wants to act like a medieval king should. And so he breaks with Edward I. He makes a deal with France. And naturally, this is an act of aggression uh, towards England. Edward I invades. He fights the Battle of Dunbar. We call it the Battle of Dunbar, although it only lasted about five minutes. Uh, defeats the Scots army, goes up to Dunbar Castle, where he meets with John Balliol. He takes his coat and he tears it from his body. He makes him a tomb tabard, a man without honour, an empty coat. John Balliol is then taken down to the Tower of London, uh, where he is imprisoned uh, for the next 15 to 20 years and has a rather cushy existence of it. So, uh, Edward I now has de facto control over the Scottish Parliament. And going back down south, he thinks that's the end of the trouble. He's supposed to have said to have one of his aides crossing back over the border is a good service to rid oneself of a turd. I'm not going to give this any more thought. Of course, the Scottish nobility uh, is outraged by Edward I's annexation. And so rebellion starts very, very quickly. By 1296, the rebellion is in the hands uh, of two major leaders. Firstly, Andrew de Murray, who's commanding the rebellions up in the north. You've got rebellions led by the commons in and around Badenoch and Perth. Um, and of course, you've got the rebellion led by William Wallace uh, in and around central Scotland as well. Now, initially, these rebellions are rather successful. Uh, William Wallace defeats the English at Stirling on, uh, on the 11th of September, 1297. Um, but immediately he, he goes on rampage. He tries to open up Scottish ports, um, but this goes against him. Edward I obviously wants to get his own back, invades, defeats Wallace at Falkirk on the 22nd of July, 1298, and Wallace goes on the run, raiding and trading for the next six or seven years before he is captured at Rob Royston in 1305, sent down to London and executed. The next, uh, uh, next two years or so, um, rebellion is really in the hands of the Commons and the Bruces. Not the Bruce that had been chief candidate for the Scottish throne back in, 12, uh, in 1286, uh, but rather his grandson, another Robert Bruce. So it gets rather confusing. There's about three Bruces that get involved uh, in the story. Now, Robert Bruce, prior to 1305, has actually been, you know, toing and froing between uh, support for the English and support uh, for the Scots. Again, he's a political animal. If anyone can get him, get him as close to the Scottish throne as possible, he is going to side with them. Um, however, his rebellion is put down and Stirling Castle uh, is subjugated. And Edward I now thinks, well, I need to finish this rebellion once and for all. It's been going on for too long. I will take the two main leaders of the rebellion, John Common, and Robert Bruce 
and I will make them joint guardians of Scotland. That is something that is never, ever going to work. John Common and Robert Bruce have a history together. Again, they both fought in Edward I's uh, household at the battles of Lewis and Evesham. Uh, they've actually served ransom together. They absolutely hate each other. It's, an, it's an, a, 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 a relationship that is just never going to work. And this comes to a head when they meet at Greyfriars Kirk and Dumfries uh, in early 1306. We believe they meet there because Bruce is willing to hash out a deal with Common, basically saying, look, if you support me for taking the throne, I will give you lands, I'll give you titles, I will give you everything I own, just come back in, you know, come into my fold. Common hears this agreement and laughs in his face. He goes, who do you think you are? You've got very little support whatsoever. This is a recipe for disaster. I'm going to tell Edward I what you're planning and doing. Blows break out, and uh, in the scuffle, Bruce draws a knife and he stabs Common. Now, whether we can call it murder or not is open for debate. Historians debate this all the time. Personally, Common didn't run onto Bruce's knife. Uh, Bruce physically had to stab him. Whether he was dead by the time he left Dumfries Church, it's open to debate as well. We know that he sends back one of his henchmen, a Campbell, back uh, to finish off. Uh, common in that church. But Bruce has now killed someone in a church. And in the eyes of the church, that is a big deal. Um, it's sacrilege. And as a result, uh, Bruce is excommunicated. He's cast out from the church, which, make, which makes it very, very difficult for him to bring the Scottish political community into his fold. He's been cast out by the church, the major landowners. That is a really, really bad thing. Bruce, though, takes it in his stride. He basically rides straight up to Schoon, has himself crowned king by Isabella Macduff, and he goes on campaign against the English army. And this goes disastrously wrong when he's attacked, uh, when he is attacked um, at Mevin uh, later on that year, and the Scots army is completely and utterly destroyed. For the next six months or so, Bruce goes on the run uh, over onto Arran, into Ireland and the Western Isles, possibly also on to the continent, to France, Switzerland, and Belgium as well, trying to regain that power base to make another ploy for the Scots throne. This results, therefore, um, obviously the, the famous story of the spider. He sees a spider in a cave. Um, it keeps on breaking its web, keeps on resewing it. If you don't succeed, try, try again. Now, we have to cast considerable doubt over that story. It does appear in the book of Genesis. Walter Scott makes a lot out of it, but it is enough. Uh, it's remembered by everyone. Uh, it's important to the Bruce story. Bruce turns 1307, against, goes on campaign against that English army and defeats them at Loudon Hill, uh, just outside of Ayr. And then for the next six years, gone, goes on a concerted campaign of subjugating English castles throughout Scotland. Retrospect, if we look at the situation down in England, um, it is um, Edward I by 1307 has died. And that puts uh, the throne squarely in the hands of his son, uh, Edward II. Now, Edward II, we always know him. History has given him a reputation as a man who likes um, you know, the good life. He's a man who, who, who likes poetry and horticulture, not necessarily a military man. I would put Significant, I would significantly debate that. We know for a fact they fight six campaigns in Scotland, of which four Edward wins. So, although he mismanages the English army later on at Bannockburn and also at Byland, uh, he, we shouldn't not call him a military man either. He is competent, he does know what he's doing. However, he has at this point uh, incensed the English political community because he's raising people, friends of his men like Piers Gaveston and Hugh Dispenser to high positions in the land, positions like Chancellor to the Bank of England. Now, Piers Gaveston and Hugh Dispenser are relative commoners. They are not born to these positions. Um, they're, they're basically sticking their hand in the money pot. Uh, they're abusing these positions. And for families, uh, you know, people like Thomas of Lancaster, the Earl of Warwick, and the Earls of Hereford, um, that is not on. And so naturally they break and they rebel against Edward II. This culminates in 1313 uh, with the capture of Piers Gaveston 
in Warwick Great Park. He's taken back to the castle, executed, and his head is sent in a battle back to Edward II. So the, uh, the, the move to the Bannockburn campaign in late 1313, early 1314, can't come at a better time uh, for Edward II. If he can defeat the Scots in the field, he can then turn to not only subjugating those barons, but also showing that he has got the control of the political situation. It's going to look good in his, uh, in his theatre. And thus, he can take that support, gain a majority within Parliament, and then go on to pursue his campaigns over in France and Gascony as well. And that's just the battlefield at Loudon Hill uh, today. So the situation is now set. November of 1313, uh, there are only about three or four English castles left throughout Scotland. Edinburgh Castle, which is taken early in 1314 by Sir Thomas Randolph, uh, Robert Bruce's nephew, um, by Escalade, he jumps over the walls. Roxburgh Castle, which is taken about six to eight weeks before Bannockburn by Sir James Douglas. Supposedly dressed as a herd of Highland cattle. You heard it here first, the guy's an absolute nutter. You've also got um, uh, Bothwell Castle, just outside of Glasgow, in the hands of the Fitzgilbert family, still uh, loyal to the English crown. Dunbar Castle, right down on the border, and Stirling Castle. Now, Stirling Castle is not the castle you see there today. That is a 16th to 18th century Renaissance monstrosity. Now, the castle there in 1314 is very, very basic indeed. We are talking about a timber and earth Norman fortress with a box rampart and a stone gateway. It's a building that, that is absolutely tiny. Within that castle, there is a garrison of about 60 English soldiers, and they are led by one Scots knight, Philip Mowbray. Now, you shouldn't trust Mowbray. Mowbray's wages might be paid by the English crown, but he does have sympathies for the Bruce cause. So he is playing both sides off against each other. He is not to be trusted. Now, Stirling Castle is, of course, important because it overlooks Stirling Bridge. If you can look at the upper portion of Matthew Paris's map right here, you can see that it connects northern and southern Scotland. If you hold the bridge, you hold the castle, you hold the castle, you hold the bridge, hold both of them, you hold the hinges under which Scotland is held. And for any army campaigning in Scotland, that is absolutely vital. Now, in the six weeks before Bannockburn, the castle has been under siege by the Scots army led by Edward Bruce. Now, that is a picture of the earlier siege back in 1305, Rather, the present siege would have been just across the Forth uh, at Cambus Kenneth Abbey. I don't think it's been marked down in that map right there. Now, the people in the castle know that an English army is not coming north in a month for Sundays. That is just not going to happen. Edward II's priorities, again, are just uh, subjugating the English barons and also pursuing the war in Scotland. His eye is off the ball. Um, and that is really important for the garrison holding out. They just can't. And so they make a deal with Edward Bruce. If Stirling Castle is not relieved by Midsummer's Day of 1314, the castle will automatically fall to the Scots army. Now, when Robert Bruce hears about this deal for Stirling Castle, he's actually not very pleased. Edward Bruce and Robert Bruce's brothers, they actually don't get on. So not much love is being lost there. However, as well as that, Robert Bruce knows that he is not a battlefield commander. He is a guerrilla commander. If he comes and tries to take Stirling Castle, he will also have to fight a pitched battle against any English relieving army that will be forced to come north. Now, if that happens and he loses his battle, well, the possibility of him losing further political support and further control over the English or over the Scots kingship uh, is quite high. Bruce is someone that burns out castles. He attacks supply trains. He raids and trades. He makes a nuisance himself. He does not fight in the open field. However, if he does manage to stand here and fight and win that battle at, ba at Bannockburn, he can now assure himself they'll gain the support of lords, the barons, their men, their money, their resources, their castles, their influence, and all the protection that comes with that, which up until this point, Bruce has had a, a minority in, and he'll never want them ever again. 
Bruce will be able to start carving up Scotland in his own image. He'll be able to start acting like a medieval king should. So it is a win-lose situation. It could go either way. But Bruce thinks it's the better part of valor to stand here and fight. He moves the Scots army, which numbers anywhere between... Oh, I'm just skipping ahead of myself, I think. He moves the Scots army, which numbers anywhere between six and 10,000 men from the King's Park area into the New Park and onto Balcadic Ridge, which is just outside of the New Park, where for the next six to eight weeks, those, the Scots army will train in their battle lines, forming a battle plan and awaiting that English invasion. It is coming sooner or later. Now, when Edward II hears about this deal for Stirling Castle, he's actually not very pleased. Excuse me, I've just skipped ahead of myself. He's actually not very pleased. Um, and so he decides to muster an army to gather at Berwick for the 1st of June, 1314. Now, he wants to campaign in Scotland anywhere between, uh, anywhere between 30 and 40,000 men. What he actually gets in reality is anywhere between 18 and 24,000. The reason, as I said, is that the major lords he needs on his side, the Lancastrian lords, uh, are again unhappy with his choice of favourites. If they're going to, uh, if he's going to appoint commoners to his, his uh, to the major positions in the land, they're not wanting to follow those people either. And so that puts Edward II in a bit of a bind. That means he is forced to raise and levy uh, an army. Now, in feudal England, every single county hundred is forced to raise a body of armed men for service on the king's campaigns for maybe 40 to 60 days every single year. Why 40 to 60 days? Because usually after that time, the harvest needs to be brought in as well. Now, if you can't feed the rest of the kingdom, you certainly can't feed the army either. Um, so naturally, you want to keep both sides happy. That's why most medieval military campaigns last that long. However, these men are relatively untrained. They're almost a militia. They'll train for maybe one weekend every single month. Just like the later trained bands moving forward into the 17th century, they'll turn up at a particular spot to train. Uh, they'll wait for everyone else to turn up. Um, so they'll have a bit of a party. And then when everyone has turned up, they're so sozzled, you actually can't do anything with them. So they're a bit useless. So that means that Edward is forced to further bolster his ranks with foreign mercenaries. So when we talk about English army, we're not just talking about Englishmen, there's also Scots, there's Irish, there's Welsh, there's French, Germans, Italians, Swiss, Danes, there's people from Norway, there's people from Spain as well. Something that modern day uh, post-Brexit Britain could certainly learn about. Now certainly looking uh, opposite to their Scots, opposite numbers, Although they don't have, uh, you know, as, as varied nationalities within the Scots army, uh, there is still a range of nationalities there as well. So you've got Scots there, you've got Irish there, you've got some Welsh there, you've got Ireland there, you've got some English lords there. Because remember, the English lords on the border have a tendency to switch sides according to which way the wind is blowing. You've also got some Danes, Norwegians and French in there as well. So lots of different numbers as well. So that is the army's. Uh, as they fought. So this army marches north from Berwick and it reaches Falkirk uh, by the evening of Saturday, the 22nd of June, 1314. In the morning, Sunday 23rd, they'll march to 10 miles from Falkirk, the Bannockburn, which they'll reach by about half past three in the afternoon. Now, as soon as the English army reaches Stirling, excuse me, As soon as that English army reaches Stirling, they see they've got a number of obstacles in their way. Firstly, you've got the Bannockburn itself right down there. Now, where you see the, the, the bottleneck just below the new park area, uh, that is the area around Milton Ford. It's about five feet. You could hop across that. That's not an issue. However, if you move upstream, uh, just to where the, the trees are along the bottom of the map there, um, that is the Great Ditch. That is a 40-foot ravine. It's steep, it's slippery, it's impassable. 
you try and cross that, you will fall flat on your face. And I do have first-hand experience from that. Uh, last February, I had to go and do a, a lecture to a local history society uh, on the history of the battle. Now, I thought it was a good idea and the snow and the ice and the wet to go out onto the battlefield, take some new photos to illustrate that talk. Now, I got to the head of the Great Ditch and there's a big stairway that leads all the way down it. And in the snow and the ice, I could see trackways leading down. Someone else had got down there. I thought, not a problem. I can get down there as well. I managed to fall the 440 feet from the top to the bottom in the space of about two seconds flat. So I can assure you right now, no medieval army is getting across that ditch easily. So if they can't cross there, they have to move further eastwards. And just where the second set of trees is, uh, just across the burn there, that is the area known as the Cast of Balkuri. It is nasty, horrible, wet ground to this day. However, in the summer, it will bake hard. And it is a good campsite. Down there, you've got fresh water, so you can water your horses and your men. That's a good start. You've also got protection on all, four, on all three sides, so your flanks are anchored. The Scots can't get around you. But best of all, that area provides plenty of open ground to properly form an army up. So by all accounts, that's actually not too bad. The big problem is, is that when 24,000 boots are continuously tramped across that ground and churned it up, just like in your rugby field, that is going to turn to mud. It will turn to a swamp. It's what we call post-glacial deposits. What's left over from the last ice age? It's really nasty uh, soil. It's soil that has a very low colloid, so it just won't bind together. And indeed, at the time, the Scots knew that area as the Powells. Powells and Old Scots is nasty, horrible, wet holes. And as I said, if that's making up the majority of that cast area, it is very, very hard ground to fight a battle over because you just churn it up anything, it's going to turn to swamp. It's going to turn to a quagmire. So not good ground uh, to be fighting over. Moving northwards, the English army will then have to encounter the Pell Stream burn. Now, running through St. Ninians, that has all but disappeared today. It's retreated underground, but it will slow the English army down. But finally getting over all of those obstacles, the English army is going to be on firm ground on the far side, up on Broom Ridge, give battle to the Scots over in the King's Park, and hopefully relieve Stirling Castle. Now, it sounds simple, but I assure you that it really is. So, the English army arrives at uh, Bannockburn by about half past three in the afternoon, excuse me. Just to talk a bit about sources, we've got four main sources though for the battle. Um, they all intersect, we can't trust all of them uh, at all. Um, we've got two English sources, we've got two Scott sources. The first Scott, uh, Scott source is John Barber's The Bruce. Now this is an epic poem written by the monk John Barber uh, in the 1370s, so already a generation has gone past since the Battle of Bannockburn, we can't really trust it. It's also been written for the Bruce family. So naturally, it's going to big them up as well. So we can't trust that source. We also have uh, the Vita Edward Secundi, the life and times of Edward II. Again, written as a, an epic uh, book of days for Edward II. Naturally, Edward II is paying the bills on it. Um, the monks writing that are going to big him up there as well. So we can't really trust that source either. We also have the Scalacronicon, written by Sir Thomas Ray. Now, so again, this is written by in the 1370s by his grandson. Uh, so again, it's secondhand material. But as well as that, although it's very accurate for day one, we do know that Thomas Gray does get captured very, very quickly on the first day. It's not very accurate for day two. So again, we've got to pass down on that as well. And lastly, we have the Lanacost Priory. Now, uh, the Lanacost Chronicle. Lanacost Priory is a, uh, is a monastery down on the borders. And uh, when the English army finally is defeated at Bannockburn, many of the casualties pass back through Lanacost Priory to get their wounds treated to, the walking wounded anyway. So again, that is secondhand material. You can't really trust that either. So well, what we're looking for when we're looking at a Battle of Bannockburn narrative, we're looking for where these sources agree with each other and where they disagree with each other. Um, we're also looking at um, the, the accounts of various armies. Um, 
that are stored in the pipe falls down in Westminster as well for numbers. And we're also looking at an inherent military probability, looking at how a medieval army of the period should act as well. And where there's holes in our narrative, um, we fill them in with how these medieval armies should act. So it's half past three on the afternoon of Sunday, the 23rd of June, 1314. The English army comes straight up the road, which runs roughly parallel to where the modern M9 uh, is, and they reach Milton Ford. And the first thing they can see, they have a big problem. The Scots on the far side of the Ford have prepared the grounds. They have set up traps. Firstly, what they have done, excuse me, where is it gone? The first thing they have done is they've dug potholes. They have lifted the turf, they've created divots in the ground uh, so the horse will turn its leg. That is bad enough. What they've also done is they've sewn cow troughs. Now a cow trough is four nails welded together in the center. It looks a bit like a star. Wherever you throw that down, it will always land with a spiky bit pointing upwards. The sole purpose of that is to stab into the soft part of a horse's hoof or a human foot. It's the medieval version of an anti-personnel mine. It's a pretty nasty piece of kit. From someone who has accidentally stepped on one of these, I can tell you it's not something you walk away from easily. So the Scots have sewn a couple of hundred of those down there at the ford. Now what's gonna happen if the English army just battles across that ford? They're gonna create a big bank holiday pile up on the motorway. It will be carnage there. It will slow them down. And that is not a price they can pay. So most of the English army is going to move off to the east down onto the cars to camp for the night and hope to give battle later on. However, a small body of English knights does manage to get across those traps and amongst their number is a 22 year old knight, Henry de Bouin. Now he wants to make a name for himself and at the front of his party, he can see that off in the distance, there is a lone horseman on a pony. Now he's wearing a yellow surcoat where, uh, with a red lion rampant upon it. It's the personal arms of the Kings of Scots. It's Robert Bruce himself, and he's all on his own. Now, it's, now, what is Bruce doing there at the front? Is he putting himself at the front to try and go to the English to come across those traps? If that is the case, it has partially worked. However, is it also the case that Bruce has put himself at the front because he doesn't intend to fight a battle at Bannockburn at all? If you can see the English army coming up that Roman road, in overwhelming force and he can't defeat them, that allows him to retreat towards Stirling Castle and off into the northwest in Lennox. Now he has done this previously when he stood on this ground against an English army back in 1310 as well. That time he's seen the English army are coming up in overwhelming numbers and that's allowed him escape to the north heading towards Perth and Inverness. At that time Edward II has chased after him He's got all the way up to Inverness, disease has set in, men are starting to desert, go home. And so Edward II has been forced to go back to Westminster with his tail between his legs. He's got to account for why he hasn't brought the Scots to battle. Now there's a thousand theories as to why Bruce is there at the front. None of them really adds up. But we do know that he is there and de Bruin decides he's gonna go and take him out. The rest is legend. Henry de Boon gets an ax in the face for his troubles. It ruins his day. Bruce gives him a frontal lobotomy. The only thing that Bruce can say is that he's broken his favorite ax. So first blood for the Scots. Seeing that de Boon has now been killed, his squire tries to race up to save his master's body. He is then unhorsed by the approaching Scots hobelars and the Earls of Hereford and Gloucester have also sent their horse across that ford to try and regain the situation. However, in the process, James Douglas has now started to advance his division and seeing this, the English army has been forced back, not wanting to take on the Scots. Um, in the process, um, the Earl of Gloucester, who is in that vanguard, is unhorsed. And he's again sent back to the English lines with his tail between his legs. He's embarrassed. And as a result of this, Edward II is gonna turn around to him and call him a fool and a coward for not beating the Scots. Remember this, because it's gonna have a huge effect on what happens on day two. So, first blood to the Scots. Meanwhile, 
another body of Scott of English horse has, man un, has managed to move down onto the cast uh, under Henry Beaumont, the Earl of Buchan, and Sir Thomas Gray. Now they're going to see at the top of the rise, in about half a mile away from their position, up near St. Ninian's Church, which is uh, where Little and uh, Sterling Police Station is today, there is a Scots formation completely and utterly unprepared. Now, if those knights charge into that formation and they break it, they will separate Wallop Bruce not only from the rest of his army, but also from Stirling Castle and his retreat route to the northwest as well. They can break the back of the Scots army here and now. So it's all to play for those English knights are going to charge in. The reason that formation uh, is unprepared, though, is because its commander is still over with Robert Bruce. His name is Thomas Randolph. Now, he's the Earl of Murray, he's the King's second in command, his nephew, and he's also the captor of Edinburgh Castle. So long and short of it, he knows what he's doing. Now, he is over with Robert Bruce, giving him a telling off for putting himself in danger at the front of his army. However, Bruce turns around to him and he puts him down. He basically tells him to get over himself. A rose has fallen from your chaplet. Get back there, form a defence, make sure those knights do not get through our lines. That is exactly what Randolph decides to do. He forms his men up, excuse me, while we just go back a bit. He forms his men up into Shultram formation. Now remember that word, um, because the Scots are gonna use a lot of it in the Battle of Bannockburn, but Shultram in Old Scots, it basically means a thicket, a really thick, thorny, spiky uh, hedge. Now that's a really good description of what these formations actually would have looked like. Imagine, if you will, a big block of men. There's a thousand men in each one, to so maybe 1,200. They're in six to 12 ranks. That's enough to stop a horse. And each one of them is carrying a 16 to 18 foot long pipe, a big spear. It's basically a human hedgehog used to kill in combat cavalry. Now a horse is an intelligent beast. It knows not to run onto a sharpened stake. That's not good for anyone's health. The knight on top of that horse, though, is pretty thick. What he's going to try and do is charge into that block of men, get in amongst their ranks, make a big hole, burst them apart, and ride them down. Now, that's exactly how Edward I has managed to beat William Wallace at Falkirk on the 22nd of July, 1298. Now, in the 17 years between Falkirk and Bannockburn, the English army is not in a better way of breaking up these formations. So once again, those English knights are going to charge in. Don't for a minute though, think that the Scots are the only ones using the short term uh, as a military formation, because we know at exactly the same time uh, as Bruce is fighting his war against the English, that on the continent in 1302, the Flemings are using short terms against the French at the Battle of Courtois, the Battle of the Golden Spurs. And indeed in the same year after Bannockburn, the Swiss have used the uh, Schultrum uh, against the Germans at Mortgarten as well. So this is a formation that is diffusing throughout European armies uh, throughout this period. It's not in isolation, just within the Scots army. So those English knights uh, now need to charge in to try and break that formation. Now, Thomas Dre is a bit reticent. He can see the Scots are now starting to form up in their battle formations. Uh, he actually turns around to Henry Beaumont and Robert Clifford, and he tells them, no, we should hold back, wait till the rest of the English army has arrived, and then we can, we can deal with this short term uh, in, in piecemeal. We can bring up the archers to shoot holes in them, and then we can charge into them. However, Robert Clifford and Henry Beaumont, again, want all the plaudits. They want to be the ones to break that Scots army. They are having none of this. And so they charge straight into that formation. But this time, they cannot find an opening. They spend the next six hours riding around that block of men, kicking up the dust, becoming so frustrated that they throw their lances, their swords, their maces into that formation, trying to break it. But it's no good. The short has held firm. As this is happening, uh, James Douglas has brought up a second shot to to face off against these Scots knights, uh, against these English knights as well. So there's just no way today they're going to break up this formation. As a result of this, the English knights are then forced back onto the cast where they will camp for the night and hopefully give battle 
the following day. Squeezed like a can of sardines between the Pell stream to their front, the Bannockburn in their rear, and with the Scots now overlooking them on the ridge line as well. So the English army down on the cast is now completely surrounded. That said, though, it can be said that the Scot, that the English knight have stopped the Scots from charging down on the English army as it has marched down onto the pass. The English army is in something called a line of march, which means that as they have come up the Roman road, they put all the fastest troops in the army, the knights on horseback, the men at arms at the front, the infantry, the guys on foot in the middle, and then the baggage train behind it as well. So that English army along that road is stretched out over about 15 miles. They are not traveling anywhere fast. And that's also going to have a huge effect to play on day two of the battle as well. However, have no bones about it. It has been a bad first day for the English army. They have lost two fights. That is bad enough. What is worse is that now within that English camp, the commanders are arguing. Chief amongst those commanders are the leaders of the vanguard, Humphrey de Boon, the Earl of Hereford, and Jobet de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester. Now, Humphrey de Boon is an experienced campaigner. He has five, six campaigns against the French, the Irish, the Welsh, even against Edward II himself. So he knows what he's doing. He's been made marshal of the English army. Opposed to him, you have Jobet de Clare. Now, he's 23 years old. He has absolutely no experience of war whatsoever. However, he is cousin to Edward II. He is one of the richest men in England. And so naturally, Edward has made him master of the army. So these two commanders are butting heads against each other. There is no clear uh, pyramid of command within that English army. And as a result of this, the Earl of Hereford might tell one unit of soldiers to move to one side of the field. As soon as they get there, the Earl of Gloucester will turn around and say, no, I don't want you over there. Move back to where you were originally. So it means that the organization, the deployment the English army is forced to make down on the cast is completely higgledy-piggledy. It's also back to front as well. The knights have been so used against those Scott Shotrams on day one are going to remain at the front, whereas the infantry, the archers that now need to be brought forward to break up the Scott Shotram formations, they're now stuck at the back. So the English army down there on the cast is now back to front. That said, it has not been a silent night for either army. Round about midnight, um, the Earl of Athol, who has served in the Scots army up until previously, has actually changed sides. He goes over to Canvas Kenneth Abbey, where the Scots camp is, and he burns that camp as well. He kills William Darth, he burns all the Scots tents and their baggage, and he forces the Scots camp followers from Canvas Kenneth Abbey up onto Gillies Hill, which is about 45 minutes walk away from the main area of fighting on the Bannockburn battlefield. That's going to have a huge part to play uh, later on, on day two of the battle. However, as well as that, people are now starting to change sides. And within that English army, there is a young Scots knight. His name is Alexander Seaton. Now, previously, he's actually served under Robert Bruce as his steward for his lands in Yorkshire. So he's a bit of a turncoat. Seaton now decides that it's a good idea to go and change sides. He goes from the English army straight over to Robert Bruce and he tells him this. If you fight your battle tomorrow, there is no doubt about it. You will win. That English army down there is tired. It is hungry. It is fed up and it's ready to go home. Child down there in the morning and I can guarantee that the English army will break and scatter, which is exactly what Robert Bruce decides to do. At 4 a.m. on the 23rd of June, the English army on the 24th of June, the Scots will form up on Balcony Ridge in three big blocks and they will advance down to the mace of that ridge line. And they will kneel in prayer. Um, they are taking absolution for what they're about to do. Edward II, waking up to this, turns around to one of his main aides, uh, Gilbert of Umferville, and he says, look, the Scots, they're kneeling for mercy from me. Gilbert Umberville turns around to Edward and he says, they're asking for mercy, but certainly not from you. They're asking for it from the Almighty for what they're about to do. The Scots then stand up and they do something the English have never seen before. They advance. Previously, at Falkirk and other battles, those short terms have been static. Ideal uh, targets for the English archers. Now they are taking the fight 
to that English army. And the English army has to react to this very, very quickly. Now, remember the Earl of Gloucester has been called a fool and a coward the previous day for not breaking the Scots. He now knows it's his time to shine. Now, in his eagerness to get stuck in, Gloucester's going to jump on his horse without his coat of arms, without his armor, don't try us at home, and he charges straight into the center of the Scots line, into Edward Bruce's division. Now, initially, he forced them back here on to the dry field, of roughly where Bannockburn High School is today. It buys the English army vital minutes to properly form up. However, in the process, Gloucester is killed, serves him right. However, by doing that, he's now created a big gap on the Scots left wing. And that allows English archers, who have until this point been stuck at the back of the, or back of the English army, it now gives them a chance to move round the side to the west and shoot two bodies into the Scots flank. They're chased off, though, by Robert Keith's Scots knights who ran them from the field. And all this time, the Scots continue pushing forward, stabbing, skewering, slaughtering every single thing in their path, with a side order of bludgeoning, stabbing, and slashing. It's carnage down there. Now, by this point, that English line has started to concertina. The back of the army is now trying to spread into the front. The vanguard of the army in the front is trying to spread into the back. Men are running left, right, and center. Any command control now within that English army has gone out the out the wood. Out, out, out. It's basically gone. Um, so complete chaos is now reigning. Now, as a result of this, the English army is slowly being pushed back towards the burn. The English army now seeing that they're not making any forward progress against the Scots whatsoever, they're being attacked from all sides, decide now is the time to cut and run and save the Dossons. They're going to try and pull back across the burn to the southeast in an orderly fashion to fight another day. However, in the process, they get stuck in a bottleneck in the burn. And in the rush and the crush and the panic to get away, between seven and 8,000 Englishmen are thrown in the burn, crushed under the weight of their armor and drown. So you can walk across the burn without even getting your feet wet on the backs of the dead bodies. It's a human bridge down there. Edward's army is broken, and that is before sunrise. The fighting has bedded us now. Now, amongst those dead, 50 of them have been English knights, whereas 50 English knights have also been captured. So the flower of English chivalry has fallen on the Bannockburn battlefield. Put that into comparison, the Scots have only lost maybe between 200 and 900 men at the very most. Out of that number, only two of them have been knights. It doesn't sound like much, but in the grand scheme of things, it is certainly proven a point. Edward II, by this point, is now in the thick of the fighting. Now, by all accounts, he's had a rather good battle. He doesn't really have a clue what's going on around him. But it is clear to all and sundry, if he stays on the battlefield, he is going to get killed. The Scots are starting to surround him. They're grabbing at his harness and his reins. He will get killed if he stays here. So he's dragged away by his household of 600 knights, led by the Earl of Pembroke, to around here. They stop on his main bodyguard, a 33-year-old knight, Gilles de Argenton, the finest knight in Christendom. He turns around to Edward and he tells him this. Sire, you're now safe. You can get up to Stirling Castle, not a problem. We will cover you. We're expendable. But I have never left the battlefield before in defeat in my life, and I'm not going to start now. I'd be disgraced. And so he, with Edmund Morley, charges straight back into the Scots lines, where you guessed it, he gets killed pretty quickly. Brave, certainly, possibly a bit foolhardy, possibly a bit brash, but we are still talking about it 703 years later, or 708 years later, for the wrong reasons than he intended. We still remember it anyway. So, Edward II, he is now clear to get up to Stirling Castle. At this time, the Scots camp followers have now come down off of Gillies Hill. Whether they get involved in the fighting is very, very debatable indeed. It's about a 45 minute walk between Gillies Hill and the battlefield. Uh, it's in, at about 4 a.m. in the morning. And it's also a case that if you go down onto the battlefield, you actually can't see Gillies Hill. And from Gillies Hill, you can't see the battlefield either. So whether they took part in the fighting or not, is open for conjecture. Certainly we know they come down off that hill though after the fighting is finished and they start to loot the battlefield clean. 
Uh, we know for a fact that they took about 120,000 pounds in loot. Now, if you put that into today's values uh, with uh, inflation, that comes up to a rate of about, uh, about 120 million a uh, day as well. So the Scots army goes home very, very rich men indeed. However, in this lull, Edward II is allowed to escape back up to Stirling Castle. But when he gets there, Philip Mowbray, who I told you not, you shouldn't trust at the beginning, he turns around to Edward and he tells him to get lost. He says this, Stirling Castle is now indefensible. If you come through its gates and it gets captured, you'll be captured and the ransom price will be Scotland and Northern England. It will bankrupt England. That is not a price Edward Carnarvon is willing to pay, because if that happens, he, uh, the Scots will bring him to the negotiating table. He will be forced to recognize their independence. And so taking a fast horse, he retreats down the northwest, uh, down the southwest side of the battlefield, chased by about 50 knights led by Sir James Douglas. They pursue him all the way back down the line of the M9, firstly to the Nifco, wherever the second stops, the chronicles say, to relieve himself of water. He basically needed a wee. He's cut short though, he jumps back on his horse and heads back down to Dunbar, which he reaches by about lunchtime. Dunbar is 60 miles away from Stirling and he takes a ship from there back to safety in Berwick, leaving a third of his army dead there on the fields of Bannockburn. Now, prisoners at Bannockburn are starting to be taken. Bruce had said at the beginning of the battle, that no prisoners were to be taken, no quarter was to be taken. The reason for that is if he took prisoners, that would deprive his, his short terms of men to take those prisoners to the rear and also to guard them. By depriving his short terms, that creates holes to which the English cavalry can charge into. It's something he can't afford to do. However, the fighting is now finished and prisoners are there for the taking. It fills up Bruce's coffers. The main prisoner um, that is taken uh, firstly, is a 65-year-old Yorkshire knight, Marmaduke de Twain. Now, he had actually previously captured Robert Bruce in 1302, and he'd given him good service. He'd wine and dined him. He'd given him a really good time while Bruce was prisoner. Bruce now personally takes him prisoner. He turns around to Marmaduke de Twain, and he says, look, you gave me good service back in 1302. I will give you good service now. I will wine. I will dine you. I will have your wounds, uh, wounds cleaned and, and seen to got nothing to worry for. So uh, Marmaduke Twain is allowed to return back to his lands in England. The most high profile prisoner taken at Bannockburn though is Humphrey de Bruin, the Earl of Hereford. He escapes with his household back to Bothwell Castle, just outside of Glasgow. He goes there because the Fitzgilbert family up until this point have been sympathetic to the English. He goes to sleep there that night only to wake up in the morning to find that the Scots army under Edward Bruce is at the castle gates. The ransom price for, uh, for uh, de Bruin uh, will be the return of Bruce's wife, his daughter, his sisters, Isabel and Macduff, they found him at Schoon in 1306, and also Bishops Wisher and Lamberton that had anointed him uh, in 1306 as well. They had all been taken prisoner as soon as Bruce has seized the phone. However, Hereford is a bit of a big head, turns around to his captors and says, no, I'm worth double that, triple that, raise the ransom price. He does himself out of a rather good deal. But that's the Earl of Hereford for you. That's Bothell Castle right here. In the immediate aftermath to the, uh, to the Battle of Bannockburn, Bruce goes up to Stirling Castle and the first thing he does is he slights it. He tears it down. He undercuts the earthworks. He burns the castle to the ground. So it can't be held against him ever again. Stirling Castle before Bannockburn had been besieged six times previous in the first Scots War of Independence. If it held out as a garrison any longer, it's going to be besieged again. And not only that, remember that Bruce's army is small, his war chest is small. If he garrisons that castle, he's got to pay for their upkeep and their food, money that he can't afford. It's far cheaper just to destroy the castle. And then in November of that year, 1314, Bruce returns to Canvas Kenneth Abbey. Parliament is held, and he is finally proclaimed true King of Scots. While he's there, he makes a proclamation. If you have supported me in my wars, that is fine. You have nothing to fear from me. However, if you don't support me in my wars, I will take your lands, your titles, your men, your money, your resources, you name it, and I will give them to men more deserving of them. 
That means that families like the Balliols and the Commons that have been forced out by Bruce, they are now stripped of all their lands. For the next 30 years, they will go down into England, petitioning the English crown uh, to campaign to regain their birthright in Scotland. Although Bruce solves an immediate problem by passing this proclamation, he also sows the doom uh, for his son as well. That doom uh, manifests itself uh, in 1345 when uh, the, you know, the Second War of Independence has been raging since 1332. But in 1345, his son David Bruce is actually captured at the Battle of Neville's Cross. And the first place David Bruce is taken uh, as captive is actually King John's Castle down in Odium as well. I used to live uh, just down the road from there. The immediate aftermath of the Bannockburn, 1315, Bruce tries to secure the border. He actually raids Carlisle unsuccessfully. Uh, he's trying to make sure uh, that he can strengthen his position uh, along the English border. Of course, you know, Edward II is continuing sending incursions into Scotland and even goes as far in 1322 uh, to try and have Scotland uh, excommunicated uh, by the Pope. Um, try and cast out so they have no legal standing in the, uh, in the European courts, uh, try and make sure they can't gain allies. As a result of this, the Declaration of Arbroath is signed, basically saying, look, we are being oppressed by the English crown. Scotland has a right to stand on its own two feet. Um, and if Bruce you know, does bad by us, we can also kick him out as well. So it is a very, very modern document indeed. Of course, fighting continues and the situation does grow worse as Edward II uh, not only abuses Magna Carta, but also continues to raise uh, the position of his favorite, Hugh Dispenser. Rebellion breaks out amongst the, the, uh, the barons again in, the in 1319. Uh, the Earl of Hereford, who had fought under, uh, under Edward at Bannockburn, uh, leads that army and this results in the Battle of Borough Bridge uh, in 1319. Barbridge is very, very interesting indeed, because although we look at Edward II as a bit of a bungler, uh, we can see from this battle that he is starting to learn the lessons uh, of Bannockburn. Uh, he forms his men up on the field into Shulchan formations, and this is intersected uh, with the Hearst formation. So for every block of spearmen, he will intersperse a block of archers. And as well as that, all the mounted men at arms, the knights, are now on foot as well. So although it's a long time in coming, Edward II does learn his lesson from Bannockburn. Of course, though, you know, trying to get this, 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 uh, trying to subjugate the barons is all too late. And Edward II is deposed by uh, his wife, Isabella, and her love, Roger Mortimer, sent into prison uh, and is quietly done away with in favor of his son, Edward III. The war in Scotland will continue right up until 1328, and it is only with the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton that peace is finally signed. It has to be said begrudgingly from England, uh, they want to now pursue their wars in France. If they're fighting in Scotland as well, they can't do both. So a short peace is signed between England and Scotland, but it will last only a further four years before a second war of independence will break out. Last thing we need to talk about is some of the battlefield archaeology done on the battlefield. Uh, the, most, uh, the most recent uh, expansive set of archaeology done on the battlefield was part of the Bannockburn Big Dig uh, in 2013-2014. I actually worked on that as uh, one of the archaeological supervisors uh, with the Centre for Battlefield Archaeology at the University of Glasgow. Uh, that was with Neil Oliver and uh, Dr. Tony Pollard. Now, during that survey work, we uncovered about 3,000 metal detector finds, only three of them identifiable uh, to the 14th century. Most of them were tracks, couplings, and fittings. Um, however, we take that data set, um, all the stuff that was unidentifiable over an 800 meter stretch does give us an idea of the extent of the fighting at Bannockburn. However, the three items that we did uncover were all part of horse furniture. We've got a, a stirrup iron, a prick spur, 
And the copper alloy cross with traces of gold and blue enamel on it, something we call horse furniture. That would have been braided into the horse's mane and bridle. First, is to show that the rich man, that the guy riding that horse is a rich man. You don't want to go and kill him. You want to go and send him back to his family. But as well as that, when the angel comes to take that knight up to the pearly gates, once he's been killed, the angel knows to take him upstairs rather than down to the hot place down below. Now, three items are never, ever going to make a battlefield. They never will. However, compare them to similar battlefields like Shrewsbury or Barnet that have absolutely no fines whatsoever. It is a start. There's two theories to how they've been deposited. The first is that a knight has ridden along the banks of the, of the burn, the horse has bolted, that's have been lost, but that don't, really doesn't make much sense. You've got to remember the horses these knights are riding uh, cost a good king's ransom. That's like taking your top of the range Ferrari down a muddy road. That really doesn't make much sense. So if that doesn't make much sense, the only possible explanation for them can be starting to find archaeological evidence for the English heavy cavalry collapsing on the cast early on the 24th of June, 1314. As well as that, uh, back in 2003, a Bodkin arrowhead was found up near the Bannockburn Memorial on Monument Hill. Um, however, the battlefield at Bannockburn is barely a mile away from the Sockyburn battlefield dating to 1488 as well. That arrowhead could quite as easily date to 1488 as it could to 1314. So it's not conclusive evidence for the battlefield either. No mass graves have been found as of yet. There is one account from the Scala Chronicon which says there might be graves over near Cambus Kenneth Abbey, but that's about three and a half miles away from the fighting and on the far side of the fort. It doesn't really make much sense to transport all those bodies killed during the battle all that distance. It doesn't really make much sense. However, there is one field right next to Bannockburn House, and that's known as the Bloody Folds. That has always been our best guess for a possible mass grave. However, we did extensive geophysical survey on the grounds there in 2013, and we didn't find any evidence for mass earth movement there associated with a grave cut. We've also got to remember that this area did used to flood on the seven yearly cycle. The ground is extremely acidic, so you throw anything like bone, textile, arm work into it, um, it's going to break down over about 60 to 70 years. Um, so that is not going to survive in the ground. We need to look at uh, battlefields of a similar time period, so places like Towton and Bisbee, to understand what those mass graves uh, would have looked like. Those graves have been uh, deposited under a particular set of deposition circumstances. At Towton, they've been buried into frozen soil. That's kept, kept the bodies articulated, and they've also put a church on top of that. At Visby, if we can just find the Visby graves, um, when the fighting is finished back in the 1360s, it's been a hot summer's day. The bodies that are left on the battlefield, the armor is so out of date that they've been thrown into the grave cut and the armor has thus kept those bodies articular as well. Those are the exception to the rule though. We don't get that kind of thing in Britain uh, very much. So we can continue looking, uh, but the chances of finding any possible graves associated with Bannockburn are, are few and far between indeed. Lastly, as I said, if you're ever in the Stirling area, please do come and have a look at the Bannockburn Centre. We are open seven days a week, um, costing nine million pounds. We opened for the anniversary, the centenary of the battle back in 2014. And when you go for the experience, you are taken into an audio-visual um, auditorium where on all four sides, you will see scenes from the battle uh, depicted on all four walls. You'll have arrows flying towards you. You'll have knights and men-at-arms riding towards you, men-at-arms beating two bells out of each other. Um, as I said, tours run three, uh, uh, six times a day. First one is at 10 a.m. in the morning. Last one will be at three o'clock in the evening. As I said, we would love to see you. All that's left to say, ladies and gents, is thank you very much. I have taken a, a bit too much of your time. Uh, but thank you very much uh, once again. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Warwick. Um, if you want to demute yourself, I thought that was an excellent talk. Um, if you want to de demute yourself, I know there's better experts than me on this, so you know, <laughs> do ask away. Tim. Um, yeah, um, well, Day two, um, there seems to be a lot of confusion as to where precisely day two is. 
Yes. I think you possibly answered this by saying we've we've looked all over and there's lots of bits of metal, but only three bits dating back to the 14th century. That's so, right. I mean, I, I don't want to pin, you know, uh, I don't want to pin it down on the cast area because, you know, they could be battle related. They could not. Um, you know, I think pinning them as being totally battle related uh, is going a bit far. I think we need to, it's a big problem with, with creating battlefield boundaries in that because it is a 700 year old battlefield with little archaeology, it creates very, very difficult, it makes it very difficult to, to, to tie in where that fighting actually occurs. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to tie it in anywhere, it's got to be on the slope of that ridge line and, and just beneath it, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably fighting on top of the ridge line, fighting down around the Bannockburn, but it's in a very, very small area. If anything, it's, it's in an 800 meter stretch uh, right at the base uh, of the ridge line. Right, right. Uh, also, I seem to remember, I've, I've only visited once. Yes. Um, there's there's a, a, a rock with a hole in it, which marks the location right. of the of, of the original first battle, I believe. Yes, so that is the boar stone. Now it's a granite yeah. rotary quern stone, a millstone uh, that would have uh, originally sat in one of the mills along the burn. Now, originally that actually stood just below where Bruce's statue is. Um, and if you go up there today, um, there's a big B plaque marking where it is. Um, because of conservation purposes, um, it's actually been taken down into the center now. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the story is uh, traditionally, and, and you know, historians, myself included, we don't really believe it. Um, the story is, is that the stone marked the site where Bruce raised his personal banner uh, in May of 1314. Um, the reason we've got to cast considerable doubt about it is the first time that story appears is actually in about 1723. And the only other account we can see of it afterwards is in tales of a grandfather from the 1820s by Sir Walter Scott. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say that the, the boar stone or a boar stone wasn't on the site there in 1314. It's just that our current boar stone that is there, the possibility of it, of it dating to the battle, you know, it, it is quite debatable. Um, that said, if you go down to the center of the day, you will notice that it's actually in two parts. And the reason it's in two parts is in the past, there wasn't always a souvenir shop at the battlefield. Um, the next best thing, uh, chip chunks out of it. Um, and if you go onto eBay, uh, bits of the boar stone do still turn up. So you can make an absolute fortune off of boar stone paperweights. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'd heard that bit. The, 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 the local blacksmith loaded out his chisel and a hammer so you could get bits of the... That's the one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you. Could, I, could I ask you about the theories about the the we folk yes. the references to this bizarre group of people who appear to have created a certain degree of concern in the english ranks and yes. their possible connection with the um the references to the knights templar being present right. okay um right the we folk for start off with we know for a fact that they start off the battle on the 23rd in the Scots siege camp and that's situated around campus Kenneth Abbey. That camp is raided on the night of the 23rd and we know for a fact that the camp followers to try and get some refuge go behind the Scots army and head up towards Gillies Hill which is about a mile and a half away from the battlefield. Now we know for a fact they come down off the hill um, and they get involved on the battlefield in some way late you know, later in the fighting on the 24th. The problem with that source uh, and with them getting involved in the fighting, the only account of it actually comes from John Barber's The Bruce. Um, talking to my colleague who is, is, is a doctor of medieval history, his belief uh, is that if it had been such a big event, if the English had believed that, you know, there was another army coming onto the field to, to attack them, it would have been mentioned in other sources and it, it's just not there. Um, so that's not to say that, you know, the Scots did, camp followers didn't play a role in battle. I think it's probable they did. Whether it's as big a role as, as you know, other histories have suggested it recently is open for debate. 
The Knights Templar. Um, I am afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. Uh, the first record of the Knights Templar being at Bannockburn actually dates to about 1870 from the uh, from the Templar Society of Scotland. Um, naturally, the Templars you know, and the Freemasons want to link themselves to the Bruce cause, um, and so they write themselves into it. Um, it, it. The story also comes about around the time they put a, a, free, a, a, Mason, a Masonic uh, casket into the main can there. Uh, we don't know what it contains, um, but I'm afraid that is the first time the story um, actually does occur. It's also the case you've got to remember um, the, free, the, the, the Templars themselves have been, um, have been excommunicated by Philip the Fair of France in, in 1313, and Bruce has been excommunicated. Now, Bruce needs to get back in favour with the church, um, bringing freelance Templars into his ranks is not going to do him any good either. And that's not to say that he doesn't have you know, uh, Knights Templars in his ranks that he doesn't know about. It's just that does he knowing them, knowingly bring them into his ranks? There's not really that much evidence to support that, I'm afraid. Nice story, okay, and I'm not going to tell you not to stop believing it, you know, because it is part of the a part of the wider, you know, tradition around Bannockburn. Uh, but in terms of history, there's there's not a lot to actually back that up, I'm afraid. Thank you. But could I could I just start extend it when you were talking about the what, what evidence is there about um, all the um, like the Italians and the Danes and people like that. I've no, I, I have to say, in reading I've ever done, I've, I've never noticed that before. It's really kind of quite intriguing. Yes. So if you go down to the pipe rolls uh, down in Westminster, we have all the accounts for all the people that are hired uh, to serve uh, in the English army. We've got all the livery and maintenance contracts. Basically, you know, when you bring in mercenaries into your army, uh, you make out a contract basically saying, look, I want you to serve in my army for this amount of time. I will feed you. I'll pay for your medical care, your food. I'll wine and dine you. Absolutely fine. Just come and serve in my army. So that's how we know all these nations are coming in into the English army. We also know, of course, that Edward's, you know, the second, as well as being king of England, has also got lands still in Aquitaine and Gascony and Normandy. He's got men they can draw to him from all over the place. So he's, he's bringing in feudal retainers to support him. That said, though, although we say there's all these different nationalities in the English army, we're not all sure that they all turn up. For example, we know that 300 Italian crossbowmen are paid for uh, about seven weeks before Bannockburn, but in all the historical records we have the battle, we've got no account of them actually turning up. So it is quite possible uh, we're still chasing up a 700-year-old you know, outstanding debt to the Genoese. Um, but certainly that's why there's such a, a disparate number uh, within that English army. Thank you. You're very welcome. Maxwell. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Uh, just following on from the last topic there uh, about the, the small folk and the first mention of it being John Barber, and uh, because none of the other uh, English sources, and some were written within the first year of the battle, mention the presence or, or the small folk coming, there are, there are also other things written by John Barber that are not mentioned in the sources, so yeah. such as the, the 500 light cavalry. Yeah. And that, that, that only comes from someone who's written in 13... Oh, it's about 65 years after the battle yeah. or something like that. So uh, just wondering how much we can actually dwell on someone who's for the sake of good storytelling and he did write it and get a pension for it with yeah. uh, King Robert. Um, what, uh, what was invention and what we actually know through eyewitness accounts and chroniclers? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very variable indeed. And, and lots of Barber, I would put in the same, the same boat as, as Blind Harry as well with, with the Wallace. Um, yeah. We know Robert Keefe and, and James Douglas are supposed to control the cavalry. Whether they actually came into play is, is open to, for debate. Whether they're actually is, acting as like a flying column to plug in holes uh, within the Scots army as and, as and when they're needed. That's quite possible. We don't know whether they've even mounted during the battle either. So as I said, you know, 
I, you know, I wouldn't put too much faith in, in, in a lot of, of the historical account just because yeah. the material is not there. Um, yeah. Because the, the, the Secundi and the Lanarkos, and th there are a couple more, they're yeah. quite adamant that the Scots are all in foot. Yeah. And, and it's just a, a huge difference that all of a sudden, if it had been known about, but doesn't happen until 65 years later, yeah. um, it seems to be most likely invention. I totally agree with you on that. Absolutely. All right. Okay. <laughs> Any others? Any more questions for Warwick? Charlie, have you got anything? No. Andy, any any more for any more? Oh, that's great, thank you. Uh, Warwick, I'll, just you jump in and, I'll just jump in and say what an amazing talk. And mm. James, you're to be congratulated on finding such brilliant speakers. So well, excellent. Very yeah, good. I, 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 I know nothing about this period of history, all this battle, and I've learned a lot today. So, Warwick, thank you very much indeed. Thank well, you. You're welcome. Well done. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Great. All righty. I'll. Um, if there's no more um, questions, I'll. I'll uh, get proceedings to an end. Have a good weekend, okay. all. And same Bye. to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And good you. night. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.